Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last Christmas, NASA, ESA, and various other space agencies around the world brought us the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. And of course, we've been waiting for the last six months as it's been deploying itself, unfolding, testing, calibrating. And of course, this week, we got the first imagery from those newly commissioned instruments. That was on Tuesday in a huge blaze of publicity. There was an early image released on Monday, and... Well, it's Thursday and I'm getting around to this because I'm trying to pay homage to the delays behind the JWST. Or I've actually just been really busy. Yeah, I've just been really busy. So anyway, on Monday afternoon, there was a special event at the White House where the president and vice president unveiled this image and said lots of wonderful things about, uh, you know, science. So what we're seeing is SMAX 7327. This is a massive galactic cluster. So what we've got is three things in this frame. We've got the stars in the foreground with their diffraction spokes. We have a foreground set of galaxies that make up a massive cluster. And then behind that, we have gravitationally lensed objects that are getting stretched all about. So MAX means massive cluster survey and SMAX means that it was in the Southern hemisphere. The way this worked was they had uh, ROSAT, I believe, surveyed the sky looking for X-ray sources and they wanted to see if any of these X-ray sources came from massive galactic clusters and so they went and looked at them with, photo with you know, uh, telescopes. And anything below like 40 degrees declination south had to be viewed with the uh, Hubble Space Telescope and that's what this one is. And that means that we have a Hubble image of it too. And sure, the first thing you're going to notice is the diffraction spikes around the stars are completely different. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But the main thing you should actually be looking at is the fact that there's a large number of red galaxies in the JWST image which have completely disappeared. JWST looks deeper into the infrared than the Hubble and it can see galaxies that have been redshifted beyond what Hubble can see. And that's just the near infrared. Uh, JWST also has the, the mid infrared instrument which can see, well, deeper, right? On the left there now, you see these red galaxies. These are the ones that are at the higher red shifts. And you can see these are uh, generally the ones that are being gravitationally lensed by the foreground objects. Since the targets had been announced a few days before, some uh, resourceful astronomers got to work on existing data. This is one case where they actually published a model of the gravitational lensing of the cluster based on existing Hubble data. And one of the important steps to doing this is identifying multiple galaxies in the image which are in fact lensed images of the same object. And you do this by comparing the spectra of the two objects and seeing that they're the same. Uh, this is the slide that was from the JWST presentation showing these two objects are the same. Unfortunately, as of a couple of days ago, this is no longer a new result because the team working with Hubble data came to the same conclusion. But this is still a cool image nonetheless. This is showing the near-infrared uh, imager and slitless spectrograph. What this means is there's two images there on the left and right. One shows the image that was taken, and then they take the same image but with a, spectrom a spectrograph that basically spreads the light horizontally according to its uh, frequencies. And this make, means you can take spectra of objects all across your frame. You just have to be careful they don't step on top of each other. Another instrument they have that does spectrometry is NIR-SPEC, a near-infrared spectrometer. And this works by having little doors, little shutters that open up to let light through from only specific things. So they can get multiple spectra, but they can make sure they don't step on top of each other. Importantly, what we see here is you've got four galaxies of different ages. And as you go down, the same set of spectral lines get shifted to the right to longer wavelengths as they get red shifted due to their distance. And of course, since these spectral lines correspond to known elements, we can tell what this very old galaxy is made of, or at least what it's emitting in. It's at 13 point billion uh, years old. That means it's less than one and a half billion years since the formation of the early universe. And we're already seeing oxygen and neon in there. And that's important because those are things that can only be made inside of stars. Therefore, this think this galaxy has already formed stars and some of those stars have died and thrown these more complex elements into the interstellar medium. 
Now, as an aside, they talked about how deep this image was. By deep, it means it can go and see further and further back in space. And the with the Hubble, we had what were called the Hubble Deep Fields, where they pointed the telescope at a specific point in space for a very long time, like days by the end for the ultra or extreme ultra deep fields or whatever. JWST is able to beat that in like 12 hours. And so they talked about how this was the deepest image so far, except that actually they revealed an even deeper image a couple of days before the, the release of this. This is an image taken by the Fine Guidance Sensor, and it's got 32 hours of exposure time. Also, it doesn't use any filters, so every single infrared photon that comes in is part of this image. Therefore, in theory, this is seeing deeper than the other image. But it isn't scientifically useful because we don't have the spectrographic data. So anyway, this is the more scientifically useful one. But anyway, let's actually talk about those glorious diffraction spikes that actually they're horrible. Like, because if you're a scientist, you don't want diffraction spikes over your image. Or if you do, you want to know exactly how they are formed so that you can try and subtract them out and figure out what is lying underneath them. So anyway, one way to tell Hubble images from JWST images is the Hubble will have this four-pointed diffraction spike, whereas JWST has this like six-pointed thing with actually some more points added to it for good measure. And these diffraction spikes come from light which is scattered off structures on the telescope and form interference patterns in the shape of them. On the Hubble, you have like two 90 degree crossbars supporting the secondary mirror. On the JWST, you have three of them. But more importantly, you have this segmented mirror and all the edges of those mirrors, those generate little diffraction signatures. So the six pointed star is due to the hexagonal shape of the mirrors. And then the other spikes are due to the struts. Also, since these are interference patterns, they're wavelength dependent. So if you zoom in on some of the structures, this is on the Mary image, you can actually see little copies of the mirror there in different colors as different wavelengths get produced slightly different versions of the interference patterns. So a big part of the commissioning and calibration of the instrument has been exactly measuring these effects so that scientific measurements can take them into account and perhaps see through the interference to get data that may not be readily visible without the analysis. This is from the commissioning report, which, by the way, includes an extra bonus image of Jupiter, a little more data that you might not have seen. They've gone and tweaked those contrast knobs really hard so you can actually see the ring of Jupiter in this image. Now, since we're talking about a planet, I think it's time we actually move on to the second thing they revealed. And it wasn't an image. It was just a spectra, an atmospheric spectra of an exoplanet as it transited its parent star. This was basically the sun or their sun was shining through the atmosphere and giving us data about water in the atmosphere. Now, this is a very hot exoplanet. This is one that is very close into its parent star. This isn't like an Earth-type planet where you've got oceans. This water is clouds in the high atmosphere. But, true, you know, what importantly, we are seeing water on this exoplanet with greater certainty than we have ever seen before. So WASP-96b is a half-Jupiter mass exoplanet orbiting a star which is very similar to that of the Sun, but the, the difference is that it's orbiting at about 5% of the distance of the Earth, and therefore it is absolutely baked by its parent. We can see it because it passes in front of the star, producing these uh, minor eclipses that allow us to detect, even though it is a thousand light years away. When I started studying astronomy at university in the early 90s, exoplanets were just one of those things you sort of expect to exist, but you had no theoretical evidence. But since then, we've started to see more and more of the objects. Now we're up to like 5,000 exoplanets, and JWST is going to be one of the first instruments that's going to be able to do you know, actual science on these things beyond cataloging their periodicities. This is going to be able to actually get some properties of these bodies by looking at the you know changes in the light as they eclipse their parent star. Okay, so the third image that was revealed was that of the Southern Ring Nebula, also known as the Eight Burst Nebula. This is a planetary nebula about 2000 light years away. And well, for the this is the near infrared image, but the mid infrared Murray image 
This actually finally shows us what we've known for a long time, that there are actually two stars in the core here, one of which is basically enshrouded by dust. And Murray is able to look through that dust because the dust is blocking the shorter wavelengths. So planetary nebula is the result of a star that has evolved towards the end of its life. And as it collapses down towards a white dwarf, it starts pulsing and blowing off its outer layers. And that forms this big nebula. The nebula is about a light year or so across. So the central star in this nebula has collapsed into a white dwarf, and so it's incredibly hot and emitting primarily ultraviolet radiation. That's what causes this nebula to fluoresce and luminesce as uh, this is driving it. But the second star is also you know, whipping up the gas and changing its shape, adding structure to it. So this image from Hubble is about 20 years old and of course was amazing when it came out. We marveled at the colors and the structure of this nebula. But now we have the new coolness. It's not the new hotness because infrared is actually going into colder and colder sections of the spectrum. And this is what we see now, showing nebulosity that is much further out from that central excited core that we previously saw. Similarly, the transition from near infrared to the mid infrared reveals data, uh, details in other ways. But it's also now more obvious that many of those points in the background aren't in fact stars, but they are galaxies much, you know, billions of light years away. One of the things that Hubble showed us was that wherever you looked in the night sky, if you looked for long enough and deep enough, you would see other galaxies with billions or trillions of stars of their own floating in the darkness. So this is a hundred year old image of a set of galaxies close to each other. This is a negative image, so it's darkness against the light, but you get the idea. So this is Stefan's Quintet and it's been well studied. This is the Hubble Space Telescope version. These galaxies have redshifts of about 6,600 kilometers per second, which puts the cluster's distance at about 200 to 300 million light years from Earth. And this is the new image, a combination of NIR cam and MIRI. It is spectacular, of course. I mean, look, it better be for $10 billion and all that time. But, you know, it is really, you know, a huge step forward over what we previously had. I think most notable, other than all the extra background galaxies, is that if you look at the NIR cam image, which is already deeper into the infrared than what Hubble could manage, but then we take the mid-infrared instrument and compare it. What this shows is that it can peer inside dust clouds and see new areas of star formation which are previously invisible. Astronomers have had in the past telescopes that can see this deep into the infrared, but they've never had it with a large enough mirror to provide this level of resolution and light collecting capability. But of course, it's not just the pretty pictures, it's about the science. And for anything that is far away, the science you do is with spectroscopy. So here, there's a couple of examples they have showing, for example, the uh, different wavelengths of light showing the composition of material near this black hole in this middle of this galaxy. And by using narrow band filters, it's not just that you can see that these elements exist, but you can see the distribution of these elements changes. And there's a third dimension at play. You can measure the differences in the radial velocity by looking at the Doppler shift of these lines. And there's a difference between, you know, depending upon where you are looking at it, some places are moving, well, away from the galaxy in different directions relative to the observer. And that's what we're able to measure with this. Finally, I think they saved the most photogenic image for the end. They call this the cosmic cliffs in the Carina Nebula. And, um, well, I mean, yes, this is basically a region where you've got dust clouds on one side and then you've got this clear sort of blue emission nebula on the other side. And inside this, you look it looks like you've got a lot of bright stars, right? There are stars that are forming that are driving these cliffs apart. Now, there was some question about where this actually was. And let me show you with Space Engine. The Carina Nebula sits in the plane of the galaxy. It is about seven and a half thousand light years away. But again, thanks to the power of Space Engine, we can just travel there in a fraction of a second. But what they're showing here isn't the main Carina Nebula. The main nebula is actually pretty big on the sky. It's 120 arc minutes across. So that's like four times the diameter of the moon. 
the nebula is about 230 light years across, so it is, you know, pretty massive. But to, well, nearby, there is a star cluster called uh, NGC 3324, which is a, a young open cluster of stars, and it doesn't show much nebulosity in Space Engine. So we have to switch to actual scientific footage to you know, really bring in the grandeur of what this is. So yeah, this is the Carina Nebula. Uh, this is an image that's not even taken from Hubble. This is an uh, you know, amateur basically taking a image in the desert. And the thing we're interested in is NGC 3324 in the top right here. Now, this is an image from the European Southern Observatory, specifically the Lasilla Observatory. And so it's therefore taken in the optical. But what we're seeing here is a star forming region inside this sort of, this is a bubble that is being formed in the nebula. As stars are born, the energy of their birth is blowing out gas and creating a bubble. And the cliffs, the cosmic cliffs are along the edge of that bubble there. So now by going into the infrared, we start to see features which were not previously visible in the optical, you know, because first of all, we're able to see through the dust clouds in some cases. In other cases, we're able to see fainter objects, objects that are still young and perhaps uh, enshrouded in dust, which is maybe not hot enough to be visible in, in regular light. And then, of course, we combine this with the mid-infrared instrument to create this mosaic that shows well, it shows these stars are forming in many different colors, right? So the colors are relevant to uh, what kind of, you know, what kind of stars there are, you know, what kind of activity is happening there. The, there's uh, planet forming disks and these apparently will appear sort of pinkish. Along the walls, there's an appearance of like steam blowing off. That's ionized gas that's getting excited and escaping. Some of the stars appear to have jets and other structures are coming out from, you know, it within the cloud. All of this, you know, there's it's going to take a long time to start going through this, but it, it obviously you can't deny that it is beautiful. You have to understand, though, this is not what the human eye would see. This is a false color image because the human eye cannot see so deep into the infrared. But just because the color is false doesn't mean that it's not useful. You know, by coloring these images in ways that us humans can look at them and interpret them, it lets our brains find structures and perhaps get an insight into the interpretations. Good science and beautiful imagery are not mutually exclusive concepts. The performance assessment suggested that this telescope will be able to produce data for up to 20 years, and I look forward to two decades of awesome imagery and science. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.